I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. Today's presentation is entitled, Overview of HDIAC Mission and Capabilities. My name is Steve Warzala. I am the HDIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes. Questions may be asked uh, via the chat function at any time during the presentation. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Our briefing slides will be posted on Techopedia within a few days. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. My pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Mr. Stephen Redifer. Steve is the director of the HDIAC. His experience includes uh, emergency management, national security affairs, survival, survivability, vulnerability, directed energy weapons, and space systems operations. Mr. Redifer served over 27 years in the Marine Corps, retiring at the rank of Colonel. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Redifer. Steve, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everybody, first and foremost, for taking time out of their busy schedule to attend, to attend today's HDIAC webinar. Um, uh, time is a precious commodity for all of us, and I'm grateful for you all listening to what we have to say and talk a little bit about the Homeland Defense and Security IAC. As Steve Borzala said, my name is Steve Rutterfer, and I assume the duties as the director of the HDI Act back in September. Um, we also have a new deputy director on board, who's Dirk Plant, also a uh, retired colonel. Dirk did 30 years in the United States Army, winding up his career as a counterproliferation, counterweapons of mass destruction officer. Both of us are proud to be part of the DTIC IAC team. Um, I, we wanted to put together this presentation, uh, while not a typical, highly technical one, we wanted to take the opportunity to introduce ourselves, maybe re-familiarize our audience with what the HDI Act and IAC are in general capable of, and the service they provide to the DOD as well as government. Um, I personally had experience with the HDI Act when I was on active duty, and uh, I can say that it was a very useful tool to me uh, in my command of the Marine Corps' Kim Bio Incident Response Force. So today's agenda is on this slide. Uh, my intent is to present a brief overview of the Department of Defense Information Analysis Center, or IAC, program, and then follow that up with a more detailed discussion of the capabilities, products, and services that are offered in particular by the Homeland Defense Security IAC. As Steve pointed out, you can forward questions at any time via the Defense Collaboration System chat feature. And at the end, we'll be sure we'll have time to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. If not, we'll be sure to follow up with them. Uh, the DOD IDAC is sponsored by the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. And DTIC has served the information needs of the defense community for more than 70 years. DTIC reports to the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And its mission is to aggregate and fuse science and technology data to rapidly, accurately, and reliability, reliably deliver the knowledge needed to develop the next generation of technology to support the warfighter and help assure national security. Uh, the HDI Act is part of the overall IAC program is proud to be a part of uh, that, that mission. Established in 1946, the Information Analysis Centers, or IACs, provide rapid access to relevant scientific and technical information in order to answer critical questions in support of the DOD's mission. Today, the DOD IAC helps customers utilize existing scientific and technical information and drive innovation across the DOD with technical analysis and development of material solutions to the nation's hard problems. The DOD IAC enterprise, as shown on this chart, is chartered by the DOD to provide research and analysis services, as well as agile and scalable contracting services through integrated scientific technical information development and dissemination, as well as conducting studies and analysis and other scientific and technical activities. 
The purpose of the DOD airline is to provide customer base access to information, knowledge, and this is via a wide network of subject matter experts who are available to answer technical questions as well as perform specialized research and analysis. Slide shows generally the overview of the IAC program, and you can get across the bottom the three IAC basic centers for operations, cybersecurity and information systems, defense systems, as well as homeland defense and security. And we're supported by the Air Force Installations Contracting Center um, to help us in our mission. The DOD Scientific and Technical Information Program serves as a coordinated structure for a variety of otherwise decentralized activities. And the idea is that they'll serve under the overall policy and direction of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. The purpose of this uh, Science and Technology Technical Information Program is to ensure that scientific and technical information is appropriately managed to enable knowledge and innovations to be fully accessible within the research community, industry, and the military operational community within the boundaries of law, regulation, and other directives. This program consists of many elements to facilitate and contribute to the acquisition, production, reproduction, and distribution of intellectual property. Additionally, the program provides support to the management of selected defense acquisition programs and the DOD studies program. The reasons for this scientific and technical program are the same today as those stated by George Marshall back when he was Secretary of Defense in 1951, when he initially established the Armed Services Technical Information Agency, which is now DTIC. In that memorandum establishing the organization, he stated that the end product of all Department of Defense sponsored research and development, costing vast sums of money and irreplaceable scientific effort, must be assembled, organized, preserved, and made available for the future reference by those concerned with exploring and guarding the scientific frontiers of the nation. Much as then it is today, it is our responsibility to gather up the relevant and breaking scientific and technical, technical information and ensure that that is passed to people who can use it and apply it to solving our warfighters' tough problems today. So the next slide, Information Analysis Centers. The DOD established its IACs to acquire, digest, analyze, evaluate, synthesize, store, publish, and distribute this scientific and technical information and engineering data in clearly defined specialized fields that are of significant interest to the DOD. IACs are an integral part of the scientific and technical information program as they serve as the repositories of scientific and technical information. However, it's important to point out that these IACs are a lot more than simple technical information centers or just libraries. These technical information centers or libraries are concerned primarily with providing references to or access to documents themselves or to databases. IACs, however, use a technically expert staff to assess and provide relevant technical information to meet a specific user need. So we do maintain document and database collections. However, we use scientists and engineers in these fields to perform many IAC functions. Having these scientists and engineers directly on staff allows us to first understand the problem and then allows us to provide data to help answer tar hard problems. It's not merely conducting searches for existing research and passing it on. It's understanding the problem from a science approach, understanding it from a Department of Defense or military operations approach, and then condensing available information, doing independent research, and passing on what we learn to the user in order to help solve those tough problems on behalf of the warfighter. So information analysis center activities include a wide variety of functions. First, we'll talk about are the basic or core activities, the day-to-day -day things that all of the IACs do to support the user community. So the DTIC established, DTIC established these IAC basic centers of operations the primary purpose to provide expert assistance. We're responsible for providing timely and relevant responses to questions, aid in mitigating new and emerging adversary threats. We also want to help improve capabilities in existing military systems, as well as contributing to developing uh, technology surprise through both science and engineering. 
So it's our responsibility to remain abreast of the latest developments in each of our technical areas by staying attuned to the technical capabilities not only that are being developed in the commercial and academic and government sectors, but also staying abreast of what's necessary and what the warfighter has deemed critical to his success. So it's our job to synthesize both of those, put them together, and develop products and information that can help the warfighter. Key to these day-to-day -day operations is the generation of responses to technical inquiries from the field, as well as maintaining our HD community, fostering discourse, and creating webinars, video podcasts, as well as our quarterly journal. So moving on from those basic or core tasks that we perform day in and day out here inside the IAC BCO, we also have the ability to carry out additional or tasks on behalf of our users or customer base. These additional should be a task order. These task orders are separately funded work efforts put above the basic at ETO product services. These are performed by one of the basic centers for operations, depending on the scope of the work required. Through this task order program, a requesting agency can use the IAC program as a contracting vehicle, enabling the DOD to obtain specialized support for specific projects in a very timely manner. These BCO task orders are of a limited dollar amount and duration. However, it's up to a million dollars and typically a time limit of one year in duration. These tasks are built on the existing core activities that I talked about on the previous chart and are geared to producing new data and scientific and technical knowledge that can be leveraged by the DOD as well as other government agencies. These tasks involve more in-depth research than the services provided, the basic services provided in the core contract, and they are user funded. So they can be procured very rapidly at low cost through our pre-competed contract and are available to DOD and all government agencies at the local, state, and federal level. And most importantly, the nominal timeline for procuring these services range from as little as three to four months. I mentioned previously, the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center is sponsored by DTIC, which is headquartered at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. The HDI Act is one of three DTIC basic centers of operations. These three BCOs cover the technical areas shown on this slide, providing users with focused expert technical consulting and unbiased scientific and technical information through in-depth analysis and product creation. Each basic center for operations has extensive outreach programs and fosters awareness of the IAC mission and capabilities while providing timely responses and other products to its respective user community. So in this manner, the DTIC, through its IACs, is able to synergize information gained from across a vast enterprise in order to meet the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering's goals. On the chart, you can see each of the IAC BCOs, the Cybersecurity and Information Systems IAC, and its four technical focus areas, the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center and its nine technical focus areas, as well as the Homeland Defense and Security IAC and its eight technical focus areas. Key to all of this and the bottom line for us is scientific and technical information. We and the other BCOs buy the collection, synthesis, and analysis and dissemination of scientific and technical information are able to maintain ourselves at the forefront of existing and emergency, emerging research and development. This understanding of the R&D environment is then viewed through the context of warfighter needs. As I pointed out in my introduction, both Dirk and I, in addition to having backgrounds in engineering and, and hard, the hard sciences, we're also both retired military officers. So we blend together along with understanding of scientific and technical information to attempt to develop relevant solutions for the warfighter. Likewise, we have other engineers and scientists experts in their particular technical focus area, and they aid us in providing a holistic solution to the user. Finally, a vibrant outreach program ensures involvement from a wide variety of sources, gathering information and work from the best and the brightest, which aids us in producing our monthly web webinars, our video podcasts, and our quarterly journals, which we hope increase the understanding of key technological developments 
across these broad spectrum of technology focus areas. In addition to basic research, as well as the creation of the regular products I discussed on the preceding slides, the IAC basic centers for operations are also capable of providing short and long-term analytical services. In this manner, we fill identified tech gaps by creating the missing information through analysis or synthesis of available information, or we can utilize available scientific and technical information to support applied and basic research programs, or we can conduct primary research where doing so is advantageous to our user base. Users who are registered members of the HDI Act have the ability to submit technical inquiries. Inquiries requiring four hours or less to answer are completed at no cost to the requester. For tasks requiring over four hours of work, the IAC BCOs offer the fast and flexible contracting options through task orders to respond to more advanced queries. So we have the ability to respond to these technical inquiries at an estimated time and technical four hours in any nature. It can be as simple as a research. Uh, study. It can be searching for other relevant research and passing it along to the customer. It can also be uh, independent research where we gather together the state of the art or we reach out to our network of subject matter experts to answer a particular question. Recent topics that we've responded to include um, devices for detecting traumatic brain injury on the battlefield. We've answered questions recently about batteries about breakthrough times of specific gas mask filters. All of these are well within the bailiwick of the HDI Act and again are offered free to the user. Should the answer or should the response to a technical inquiry or any other inquiry uh, go longer than four hours or should the user wish to have more in-depth research, we have the ability to conduct an extended technical inquiry as well as a core analysis task. And again, as we said, the core analysis task at the high end of these uh, responses can take up to a year and has a ceiling of $1 million. The DOD IAC, the DOD IAC program established a wide variety of technical focus areas. Each have been determined to be critical to the needs of the DOD. And as you can see, they're mapped to one of the three domain areas that I talked about previously, defense systems, cybersecurity, or homeland defense. As I've already pointed out, the IAC Basic Centers of Operation are staffed with scientists, engineers, subject matter experts, and information specialists that are specially tailored to provide a user with a focused expert assistance, as well as the creation of unbiased scientific and technical information. The IACs establish and maintain comprehensive knowledge databases that includes this technical information, as well as other information that's collected on a worldwide basis in these particular fields of interest. We identify sources and assess the relevance of data that are held by others. We coordinate closely with the sponsoring DOD technical communities, as well as the user community, as a means to focus our efforts on topics of interest or concern to the DOD. We don't want to answer the wrong question at the wrong time. So we need to stay attuned to what the warfighters' demands are and what they project the threat is going to be so that we can adjust our research to match what they need. And part of that, we collect, maintain, and develop analytical tools as well as developing techniques to include databases, models, and simulations. And we provide those in-depth analysis services and create specialized information products. IAC products and services include many things, but they're to include, excuse me, handbooks and data books, critical reviews, standards and technology benchmarks, defining problems, looking at alternative technologies, as well as conducting current awareness activities. July of last year, the Director of Defense Pricing and Contracting sent a memo that was co-signed by Ms. Mary Miller, who was performing the duties at the time of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, that was titled Preferred Use of DOD Contracts. This memo identifies the IAC contracts as best value vehicles and encourages contracting officers across the DOD to consider the IACs as a vehicle of first choice. This memo promotes the utilization of DOD IACs to the maximum extent practical for technical research and analysis requirements. 
So not only can the IACs answer those hard questions and do that research, but these task orders that can be issued can be issued very quickly, can be tailored against a pre-conceded contract that is already recognized as a best value vehicle. That concludes my brief overview of the IAC program. There's a wealth of information that's available on the DAC IAC public facing webpage that contains uh, significant information above and beyond the history of the IAC program. It also includes representatives, includes the key points, and it includes the forms and documents necessary to begin the process of requesting a task order. Now that we've broadly discussed DTIX role in this, I'd like to highlight the specific capabilities of the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center. So as we're all very aware, the United States continues to face a multitude of serious and evolving threats, ranging from domestic terrorism to covert and overt action by rival nation states. The Homeland Defense and Security IAC mission is a dynamic and challenging one characterized by a complex operational environment that contains thousands of different jurisdictions, as well as many agencies and organizations, the private sector, and several allies and multinational partners. This combination of a multifaceted threat and a complex operational environment, and certainly a no-fail mission, makes for a very daunting problem set. Our contribution to that is through our mission statement that you see here on the slide. The mission of the HDI BCO is to provide users with focused technical, expert technical consulting and unbiased scientific and technical information through in-depth analysis and the creation of specialized information products in support of the HDIX eight vital technical focus areas, Homeland Defense and Security, Critical Infrastructure Protection, Weapons of Mass Destruction, Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense, Biometrics, Medical, Cultural Studies, Alternative Energy. The HDI Act leverages the best expertise from industry, government agencies, and academia to solve the government's toughest scientific and technical problems, as well as enhance the knowledge bases of those communities across the entire spectrum of the DOD IAC domains. We rely on our extensive subject matter expert network, which includes experienced engineers and scientists, retired senior military leaders, leading academic researchers, and industry. These people have volunteered their time and are available to answer technical questions and perform specialized research and analysis via the technical inquiry process or via customer-funded task orders and extended technical inquiries. The Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center therefore helps the warfighter, program managers, researchers, engineers, and scientists to utilize scientific and technical information to drive innovation across the DoD by providing rapid technical support to assist in advancing the DOD's warfighting capabilities. In this manner, the IAC support three strategic guiding imperatives. First, mitigate new and emergency, emerging adversary threats that could degrade US and allied capabilities. Two, enable affordable new or extended capabilities in existing military systems. And finally, three, to develop by science and in support of military problems. These are accomplished by the HDI Act taking the lead in disseminating Homeland Defense and Homeland Security scientific and technological information to stakeholders, maximizing the use of existing research, building and fostering, fostering a community of practice, maintaining a subject matter expert database, and most importantly, serving as the DOD's hub for Homeland Defense related science and technology information. HDI BCO has a strong cadre of small business and university subcontractors to support these BCO operations. Quantarian Solutions Incorporated is the prime contractor for both the HDI Act and the Cybersecurity Information Systems IACs. Quantarian has over 20 years of experience in IAC operations with expertise in Homeland Defense, Seaburn, WMD, cybersecurity, and reliability 
Quantarian has a long history of reliability and at one time ran the Reliability Information Analysis Center and is currently, as I already pointed out, responsible for operating the CSIAC and HDIAC on behalf of DTIC. Our partners in this evolution consist of Insured Information Security, who contributes to the experts in the research and development of technologies relevant to deterring deliberate threats and attacks on the U.S. information infrastructure. George Mason University provides experts in critical infrastructure protection, a key risk to the nation, as well as DOD operations. Mason also explores the practical application of infrastructure protection to include business continuity, supply line security, and the application of the cost-benefit mindset to investments in security and reliance. The Guardian Centers of Georgia provides custom services that include complete exercise design and planning, training and certification, and full-service logistics support at its state-of-the-art flagship training campus in Perry, Georgia. Guardian Centers develops and provides courses and practical ex exercises for special skills certification and professional services training in the areas of Homeland Defense and Security, as well as Seaburn Defense. The Syracuse University Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism performs interdisciplinary research, teaching, public service, and policy analysis in the fields of national and information security and counterterrorism to address key and evolving challenges in national and international security counterterrorism, and post-conflict reconstruction. The National Renewal Energy Laboratory advances the science and engineering of energy efficiency, sustaining transportation, and renewable power technologies, and provides the knowledge to integrate and optimize energy systems. NREL has expertise in the areas of renewable power, sustainable transportation, energy efficiency, and energy systems integration, and has over 40 years of experience driving advanced energy research. The State University of New York Upstate Medical University conducts research covering hundreds of basic science and clinical research projects. The university is a top-tier enterprise in research in areas such as vision, cancer, neuroscience, and stem cell research. SUNY Medical also boasts expertise in microbiology and immunology. This slide covers the technical focus areas as well as gives brief definitions for each of the eight technical focus areas covered by the Homeland Defense and Security IAC. The first, Homeland Defense and Security, comprises a wide variety of areas and really covers many, many functions not, not explicitly mentioned in the other seven, but primarily counterterrorism, facility security, law enforcement, et cetera. Seaburn Defense is focused on the defense against weaponized seaburn agents. WMD generally defined as weapons that could kill a large number of people. We also are tied to critical infrastructure protection and there's a cybersecurity element to that as well. We deal with the continuity of operations as well as cyber infrastructure and national infrastructure under critical infrastructure protection. We focus on biometrics, alternative energy, as well as medical and cultural studies. So the BCO tasks I've already covered in brief, I'll go into a little bit more detail related to the HDI Act. As I've already pointed out, we acquire and distribute subject area technical information from all sources in our eight technical focus areas. As we do this, we verify and validate the technical accuracy and reliability of data that comes into our control. We generate and evaluate data collection analysis techniques. We develop alternative approaches to collection and analysis of the same or similar forms of information. We identify and work to fill voids in existing data or knowledge bases. We utilize the background experience of our BCO staff, and we leverage an understanding of data in the context of military and first responder operations, which allows us to conduct trend analysis and build on data to produce knowledge, improving military operations. We add value to the data information by presenting alternative perspectives, identifying trends, summarizing collections, developing models, and enhancing knowledge within our technical communities. Finally, we disseminate what we develop through a wide variety of meetings to medium, including briefings, conference presentation, training webinars, research and development, video podcasts, and our, our quarterly journal, as well as responses to user inquiries. Each of these products are divine, defined on this slide. The overarching thing that we use 
to unify resources and members around the concept of coordination is the HDIAC BCO website at www.hdiac.org. I encourage each of you to go there and explore the information that is stored there, as well as register to give you access to breaking uh, information as well as other products that may be put forth there. And most importantly, involve yourself in our community as well as our discussions. Quarterly, we publish the Journal of Homeland Defense and Security, which is provided to subscribers free of charge, and it is used to expand the center's research into the defense scientific and technical community. Each issue is centered around DOD perspectives, as well as significant technical topics of high interest and to our diverse community of practice. We also produce the Homeland Defense Digest, which is a bi-weekly news summary for members of the Homeland Defense community of practice. It provides links to articles and news summaries across the spectrum of technical focus area issues. It provides a succinct roundup of key articles and disseminates them in a timely, responsive manner, keeping the community abreast of breaking developments. If you subscribe at the HDIAC, if you register at the HDIAC.org website, you can also subscribe to the digest and it'll give you that roundup in your in mailbox every other week. We also host and present at least one free webinar per month, as you're witnessing here, on topics of high interest to the community of practice and leveraging and utilizing our, our users and subject matter expert contributors from government, industry, and academia. These supplement our traditional means of answering inquiries via the technical inquiry process. Finally, we also present podcasts on topics of interest to the community. These are shorter than our webinar presentations at about 15 minutes in length, and they are produced and released at a rate of about two a month. We also respond to technical inquiries, which I've mentioned briefly, but I want to emphasize it because it's one of our most important activities, and it consumes a significant portion of our IHDIX services. We really want to provide that focused, timely expert responses to inquiries from across the user community. We want to be in a position where the sergeant working in Aviano, Italy, can ask a question that his commander asked him, and we can get him an, him an answer that is current, timely, and relevant to what he's trying to do. Technical inquiries consist of requests for data, information, models, analysis, or possibly referrals to other ex experts. They may be either strictly a technical question or they can be sim a simple informational question. A TI, a technical inquiry, or TI, that is strictly technical, requires subject matter expertise in the chosen field in order for an adequate answer to be developed, whereas the informational type TI doesn't require such degree of technical support. Either can be handled, and that's why we maintain that extensive network of subject matter expertise. There are cases in which we may be asked to conduct research and analysis to respond to technical inquiries that will require more than the four free hours. This category of response is broken down into extended technical inquiries as well as core analysis tasks, which you see there on the slide. In both cases, the requesting agency will fund the task on a cost recovery basis. So HDI Act BCO task orders. An HDI Act task order may be initiated to acquire a scientific or technical analysis effort in support of a user-funded request. All task orders must have an analytical component, and they've got to generate new usable S&T information or other knowledge. Of course, they have to be within the scope of the HDI Act or the other BCO's technical focus areas. And they shouldn't be looking for information that's been previously done. And one of the first things that we do when we receive one of these is conduct a gap analysis to make sure that the user question has not already been answered in another means. There are many, many benefits associated with executing a task order through the HDI Act task order process. In addition to being recognized as a best practice, or excuse me, a best value vehicle, BCO contracts are pre-competed, therefore there is no source selection requirement, making them fast and flexible. Further, they're available to DOD and U.S. government agencies at all levels, federal, state, and local. My personal experience on active duty is I took advantage of this to have some work done on mission analysis, as well as an analysis of emergency management and kin bio responses across the enterprise, not just military, but civil as well, to produce an idea 
of where we needed to head and where we needed to go and how we needed to be manned, trained, and equipped. It was very quick. It was a very seamless process that enabled me to use available funds, whereas I had the funds, but I didn't have the time or personnel to do the research. This is just one example of how an HDI BCO task order can be utilized to support the warfighter, even at the using unit level. We're very proud of our subject matter expert network within the HDI Act, and we work very hard to expand and maintain this very, very important body of expertise that supports us in our day-to-day -day mission. This network is developed and maintained to enhance the BCO capability to respond to technical inquiries as well as conduct those more in-depth analysis tasks. We maintain and expand this network by identifying and soliciting qualified personnel across DOD, academia, and industry to serve as unpaid experts within our technical focus areas. These external subject matter experts possess additional information, skill, or knowledge that can help us meet those user needs. And they provide technical assistance, enhance responses to technical questions, as well as increasing our cap capacity to support the user. It's also a means of keeping abreast of current emerging areas by collaborating with scientists from across the nation and across the globe. I encourage all of you to, if you think that you have the subject matter expertise and you're willing to devote your time to supporting our, our young men and women on the forward lines, I encourage you to go to our website and you can see the link there under services, subject matter expert. We'll ask you to fill out a simple form, help us spell out your expertise give us the opportunity to, to vet that, and then we can add you to our subject matter expert database. I would point out that the level of effort that you put in that is completely up to you. Some of the activities that you may be asked to do are review and author journal articles, participate in our editorial board as part of that and provide a journal publication, perhaps respond to a technical inquiry, present a webinar, or create content for the HDIAC.org website. We do take great pride in that subject matter expert network. And what we do is when the applications are submitted via the website, we take a great deal of effort to validate those, looking at a wide variety of topics that you can see there on the slide. We want to, only, we want to ensure that we're providing the best, timely, and relevant information to users. And we want to make absolutely sure that our subject matter experts are helping foster the, the community of practice. Again, I just want to reiterate that anybody that volunteers to be a subject matter expert, the level of effort is completely up to them. Uh, we'll always reach out to you for your volunteer services, and anything that uh, we would ask you to do, we would certainly check with you and make sure that you were willing to do it and that you had the time and, and available uh, uh, effort to go ahead and accomplish that task for us. So please, by all means, if you're interested at all, request an application, and we can get that process started. So our points of contact, uh, these are new points of contact for the HDI Act. The contract for the HDI Act BCO turned over in September. So my contact information is at the top with uh, Dirk Plant, the Deputy Director of the HDI Act, right underneath. Um, I also added Joe Caroli. He's our Director of the Cybersecurity Information Systems IAC. Um, and then finally, Alex McDermott handles our core analysis task. Alex and uh, would be the gentleman that you'd be dealing with should you want to take advantage of a uh, extended technical inquiry or a core analysis task. That concludes the presentation that I had assembled for today's webinar. Um, I, don't, I don't know if uh, anybody has any questions, but we certainly have time left if anybody has a question about the material I presented today or anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, overview, Steve. We, uh, we appreciate uh, appreciate that. Um, so, so I guess you know, I guess one of the things I'd I'd like to mention is the um, you know with with the IX, we're we're trying to leverage you know the existing uh, scientific and technical information that um, you know uh, has already you know been put into the DTIC knowledge repository. You know, one of the you know, one of the big things I see is, you know, trying trying not to, you know, duplicate the effort. Um, I don't really see value in reinventing the wheel. You know, if you've got the good basic design, you know, 
it may not be exactly what you want, but you can work from that, build from that, and um, you know, I, ju I just think that's I, I just think that's one of the great things of the of the IAC program. And uh, you know another another thing I'd like to you know talk about that we uh, we provide is uh, you know we we tr try to provide the lessons learned you know that that folks have already gained through experience you know so once again folks can build off of that and um, you know the identify the best practices you know what uh, what's tried and true you know if, have folks gone gone down dead end avenues you know or or you know have they found the the sweet spot so. You know, we like to try to get that information out via the uh, via the IAC program as well. So, Steve, you mentioned in the uh, in your briefing the uh, eight different uh, domains that HDIAC is responsible for. Our area. So, I'm just wondering, are there any particular um, key areas that you're focusing on, uh, you know, key strategic items, uh, you know, kind of hot, current hot button, hot ticket items that you're you're looking at uh, uh, investigating. So, Steve, one of the things that we do each year is put together an operational and strategic plan, and we just recently did that. And the things that uh, we're particularly, we found areas in each of the technical focus areas that we're, we're looking at. Um, for, and these were pulled from Department of Homeland Security S&T initiative, as well as the combatant commander integrated priority list. So for example, under biometrics, we're looking for mobile bio, biometric solutions. We see that as a technical topic that's likely to grow in importance based on our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as Department of Homeland Security's experience cloud-based biometric libraries that will support these mobile biometric technologies. I think counter unmanned aerial systems is a very important technological growth area that's only going to continue to expand. Very recently, you know, United Parcel Service was granted the ability to fly drones to deliver packages. Um, I sat on a counter IED, EOD, IED, uh, countermine symposium sponsored by the Defense Strategies Institute. Uh, we can go out and moderate a panel on that very thing, countering the UAS threat. I think that's going to continue to grow. Um, seaburn defense is always going to be important to us because, uh, you know, the seaburn attack, uh, given the right conditions, could be catastrophic. So we're very interested in detection and technical forensics. Um, I think recognizing uh, homemade explosives under weapons of mass destruction or is also clearly a, a growth and focus area that needs to be worked on. Critical infrastructure protection is one that allows uh, us to capitalize on our relationship with the CSIAC. Um, the, the cyber element to that um, is very important. You know, not not just you know we think of it in civil and and dams and that sort of thing, but you know the DoD's real property portfolio encompasses 28 million acres over 500 installations and about half a million buildings and structures valued at trillions of dollars. So I think I'll, we spent a lot of time working on that, and I think rightfully so. And then uh, finally, medical uh, emerging infectious diseases, you know, Zika, Ebola, those sorts of things can cause somewhat of a crisis. We're partnered with immunologists and virologists, uh, former Army immunologists and virologists at SUNY Medical to, to work on. That's kind of where where my uh, my mind is at for uh, for this upcoming year. Oh, that sounds sounds good. It's uh, you know a lot of lot of key areas and you know a lot of uh, you know interesting research to uh, to be done in those in those areas. Uh, you know one 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 thing I'll just I'll mention. So uh, I, I recently attended the uh, C Bernie uh, Convergence uh, Conference just uh, early earlier this month and. Um, you know, one of the one of the speakers was from your former facility there. It was he's the current uh, executive officer at the at the CBRF, and um, he was he was identifying some of their their key uh, areas. Uh, you know that that they're looking to uh, explore in the future, and and one of them was was trying to u utilize 
uh, UAVs, you know, when, when they go into a uh, situation, um, you know, instead of sending people in, you know, depending on the conditions, you know, they, they, the conditions may not be good. They may not be able to, uh, you know, adequately ascertain, you know, the uh, uh, situational awareness in, in the environment. And talking, you know, he's, he's interested in looking at using the UAVs, putting different type of sensors, you know, different type of modalities, whether it be infrared or, or whatever, you know, to, to maybe you have to go into a building and, um, you know, you're looking for the hot spots or trying trying to find out what's in there where maybe it's a smoky environment and visually, you know, a person going in, you know, couldn't see anything, couldn't really tell what where they were, what they were dealing with. And um, so like I said, the, the UAVs with some sensors, um, you know, attached may may greatly, you know, enhance that uh, situational awareness element, um, you know, for, for folks dealing in situations like that. So just, just thought I'd mention that, throw that out. Yeah, the problem that we had with is the use of military using uh, um, unmanned aerial vehicles with sensors on it inside the continental United States. And I mentioned briefly the, the complex and operational environment that we exist in. You know, within the National Capital Region, there's over 42 law enforcement agencies. And, you know, the DOD by Tasek Comitatus Act is prevented from, you know, quote unquote, spying on American citizens. So one of the difficulties we always had was that. So the, the real question is, is how do you work with the folks that are authorized to do that to make sure that you get the information you can conduct your life saving mission? Sure. Yeah, I understand that there's, uh, you know, a wide variety of constraints that uh, individuals are, you know, working under. So, so I, I guess the other the other thing I'd just like to, um, you know, mention again. You know, you've talked about the subject matter experts, and uh, I assume you're, you know, you'd be interested in having folks, uh, you know, if they're you know, working in an area, you know, doing some research uh, that they'd be interested in sharing with the community. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you'd, you know, be open to having folks reach out and um, or their interest in uh, interacting with us and collaborating with the uh, with the broader community. Absolutely, I, uh, I. That's the life. That's the lifeblood, as you very well know, Steve. That's the lifeblood of the IAC. It's that new, fresh perspective a new way of approaching idea, old problems, um, absolutely. And we have, you know, means of publication through our journal, responding to technical inquiries, uh, production of webinars, just like we do today, video podcasts, um, or just, just again, you know, running a, uh, a discussion forum on our hdiac.org website, all be beneficial to the uh, Okay, uh, so the, I guess one other thing I want to check on. Uh, you, I know you you know you've talked about the technical inquiries, um, and you mentioned the CAT, uh, the core analysis tasks. Um, you know where the TIs are you know four hours free, and then the CATs, the CATs uh, you know you know can go up to twelve months a year with uh, up to a million dollar ceiling. Uh, so w there was one in between the um, extended technical inquiry. Were there are there parameters limits on that one? Uh, there are. I, I didn't mention it. It's a little bit in flux right now. My current contract says from four to 160 hours with a fifty thousand dollar cap. Uh, that has changed in uh, a recent contract modification to one of the other IACs. Right now, that's the basis. I would just encourage anyone that would like to pursue something like that to us help you uh, get you into the right bucket or the right bin that will help answer your question. I think that um, by and large, we can help with that because it's a pre-competed contract. We can help with uh, point you in the right direction. We'll certainly get you uh, hooked up with our uh, contracting officer's representative that um, Ms. Molly Steele at DTIC, and we'll get it in the right bin. If you have a question, don't let the contracting machinations slow you down. Ask the question, and we'll tell you what we can do and what we can't do, and we'll get it put in the right bin for you. Okay, sounds sounds good. And uh, 
I, I guess I'll just I've got I've got one other kind of uh, thing from experience to share. I guess when I was a uh, uh, you know, starting out my career, you know, young uh, computer scientist working with the uh, Air Force uh, Research, well, what's the Air Force Research Laboratories Information Directorate now? Um, I had to do a, you know, a study. We were working on some computer architecture stuff. And so I, I went out and I, uh, you know, put together a statement of work and went out on contract, you know, hired hired some folks to come in and solve, you know, solve the problem. And, um as it, as it turns out, you know, we produce a technical report and, you know, but as it, as it turned out, you know, uh, kind of in tandem, kind of at the same time, um, you know, counterpart from the, the Navy was encountering a, a similar problem, maybe with different systems, but, uh, you know, technically enough similar where, you know, we were both kind of spending money to solve the same problem. And I think if, um, you know, we had... Uh, tapped into the knowledge that was there at DTIC already, you know, we may have been able to, um, I think research still needed to be done, but maybe we could have augmented it and, and, and tailored it a little bit differently and, you know, kind of leveraged the dual activities. So, so I guess the one thing I just kind of, you know, foot stop again is that um, if you have a problem, you know, check, check with us first, you know, come and, Come and submit the technical inquiry. It's 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 free, and you know maybe maybe an answer already exists to your problem, and you know you you we can hand you a solution, or or you know maybe you come in and you go nope that's that's a new one, and and you know you do have to dig into it and and do some work, but but I would you know highly recommend that folks um, you know see see what's out there first before they before they just you know jump into a uh, contractual activity. And so, uh, any closing remarks from you, Steve, or? No, again, I appreciate the folks that have that navigated the, the new process for, for giving webinars, navigating the DCS system, and taking the time out of what I know from firsthand experience are busy days. Um, I really do appreciate that, and I really, uh, you know, my heart of hearts uh, will always be with the, the young warfighter for deployed. And my sincere hope is that we can help folks answer questions to make their lives better and their lives safer. So, and Steve, thanks for your support, and thanks to John Reed as well for uh, for being behind the scenes guy on this. Okay, Steve, thanks uh, once again for for uh, providing the update and. Uh, kind of laying out the uh, course for the uh, future. We appreciate that. And uh, thanks for everybody that uh, joined us uh, in the webinar today. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know when we'll have a, a, you know, another one in the near future and hope you can join us then. And uh, I'd just like to wish everybody have a, have a good day. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye now.